Well, hello, Sandy. It's nice to see you again. I hope you... Great to see you, Herb. Yeah, it's a strange time, but it's a pleasure to catch up with you and have an opportunity to talk a little bit about our shared love of music. Be my pleasure. So, um, you know, I'm interested to learn just a little bit more about actually what brought you into music, what made you decide to be a professional musician and... Um, was it experiences when you were growing up or exposure to concerts or what? Well, I think it all started when I was about four years old and there was no stopping from that point. So we know that's a long time ago. Um, my mom was a musician and a product of the 50s when the accordion was a really... Oh, a real instrument that was very popular, and she played in an accordion quartet, and uh, uh, it, she was an incredible musician. She went to college and wanted to major in the accordion. It was not allowed at that time. Um, so she took up the oboe sort of as this side instrument just to fulfill the obligations of the program. But she ended up playing the accordion a lot more than the oboe. The oboe sat vacant up in the uh, attic as soon as she graduated from college. Um, and I was always curious about it. So when I was four, she was teaching me a little bit about keyboard. Now, that I found very boring. I'm not very sophisticated using two hands at once with different uh, meters and different key signatures and uh, you know, different things to read. So um, I bugged her, can I try the oboe? I wanna try the oboe. That's just one line of music. That seems like something I can handle. So when I was eight, she let me try her oboe and I got a sound out. And anybody who has struggled with the oboe knows that that in itself is a conquest. Right. So um, I started up with private lessons right away with somebody from the Buffalo Philharmonic. He was a brilliant teacher, Colin Smith. Uh, when I got into high school, I worked with Rodney Pierce, who was the principal of Buffalo Phil. He was probably the best teacher I ever had. And his love of Bach was what cemented that for me also. Then I ended up going to college. I mean, there was just no looking back. I didn't even consider a different profession. I went to Eastman, I went to New England Conservatory. And, uh, and from there, you know, getting the job is, is always the difficult thing, trying to make your living as a musician. But I think that that, you know, those first 20 years, there was no looking back. It, it was an easy decision. Well, I'm in terms of getting a job. I'm certainly been more than delighted that, that that you've been working with Bach in Baltimore for many years now as our principal oboist, and and actually the person I go to when we need additional uh, double reed players. You've always been so terrific about helping me find people. One of those people's name is Michael. Ah, tell us about My Michael. You, of course, has this so, uh, something <laughs> shares with you. It's the same last name, right? Yes, Michael J. Lasicki. So some of you might know Michael because of his job in the BSO, the Baltimore right. Symphony. Some of you might know him because he writes books about department store history. I mean, he is a Renaissance man and he is my husband, the most difficult of all of his career choices. <laughs> yeah, that's the tough but, job, right? <laughs> but I met Michael in college. I met him uh, at New England Conservatory. And we, we kept in touch for many, many years after we both graduated and our paths always crossed. I think that's the joy of, of music. Uh, nobody is ever out of sight permanently. You're running into people on the road, at auditions, at gigs, whatever. And when I moved to Virginia to take a job at James Madison University, I knew he was playing in the Richmond Symphony. And I thought, you know, I bet he can help me get some work. And indeed he did. And at this point, we had known each other, oh, I don't know, 19 years? Wow. And yeah. So you didn't and rush into anything. We, yes. <laughs> it was a very long courtship. But when we finally decided, um, you know, I want to marry you for real. And he said, I want to marry you for real. So we, uh, within a month, we got married in Las Vegas at a uh, musician's conference at the Ixom conference, Neat. which is the international conference of symphony musicians. And we had people from all over the world <laughs> there at the conference. So they came to the little wedding chapel and we got married. So and then I had a baby like less than nine months later. So woof, it's been, but he's a great oboe player. And when he can play in Bach in Baltimore with me, it, it's just 
an extra joy. I mean, well, I, I love. Would, yeah, I always like it when you can both play because um, it's true. The arias often have just one oboe, obligato oboe, one oboe solo. But there's so much when the two oboes play together, and you two, um, for obvious reasons of <laughs> including so much time together playing, um, the cohesion of your sound is just. Uh, always a great joy for me. I just really love that very much. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm interested, you, you know, I, last time we spoke, we were talking about the oboe d'amore and it got me to remembering, um, you know, I started all this Baroque music in Baltimore, the greater Baltimore area with the Handel Choir back at, way back in 1978. And I was their music director for 25 years. And before I finished that, I, I founded Bach in Baltimore. And I remember with great clarity, um, Bach must have had a deep love of the oboe d'amore because he asked for it over and over and over again. And when I started doing Bach cantatas, um, you couldn't hardly find an oboe d'amore. There was none in Baltimore forever, then there was one. And if you needed two, you had to go to Washington. Um, and tell us about the oboe d'amore and what you, why you think Bach liked it so much and, and and by the way, how is it different from the regular oboe? Well, I can show you that, actually. Um, I mean, here is my oboe that you see me playing most frequently. And if, let's see if I can give you a, a scope. It's what, maybe a little less than three feet long, I guess. And you can see how it works. And we put the reed in at the top. The oboe de Moor is substantially longer. Look, I can't even get it on my screen. <laughs> it has an extra little tube at the top. This is the vocal, which helps extend it so that you get the reed there. And the bottom's got this fancy little, uh, little bubble at the end there, which actually doesn't affect the sound, but it looks really cool. So uh, Michael says it looks like an English horn that went through the dryer cycle a little bit too long. So uh, it, yeah. it got shrunk up there a little bit. But, so it has a deeper sound. It's got a lower sound. It actually is pitched a whole minor third lower than the oboe, if, if that helps anybody. Um, I always thought it was a darker, richer sound. The oboe um, is this gorgeous sound that sounds like a, almost like there's a certain human voice quality to the oboe, which I think is enormously attractive and appealing. But the damore um, is just a little bit lower and just a little bit darker in color. Um, I think that's true. Um, I, I've always really liked the oboe damore because it's in the middle uh, of the double reed family. We have the oboe, the oboe damore, and then the English horn, right. which, as which I just mentioned, which actually is even bigger. Um, for me, it physically feels very natural to play this size instrument, whereas English horn's a little bit too big for me, I think. Um, I love the sound. My favorite thing about the oboe d'amour is that nobody has come up with the standard tone, what you are supposed to sound like on the oboe d'amour, um, because not a lot of people play it. So there seems to be, I don't know, to me, more freedom about expressing yourself on the, on the oboe de more. As long as you're playing in an expressive, beautiful way with a pleasing sound, whatever that means. I think it's a very personal decision, but I think that our musical culture has allowed us to be a little bit more liberated about making those choices on the oboe de more. So that's, that's just why I like to play it. Then you get these Bach melodies. Oh my gosh, I mean, he found something extraordinary in the oboe de Moore. I can't even begin to say how I admire Bach. I mean, it is astonishing. <laughs> the melodic inventiveness is just mind-boggling and beautiful. And underneath it is, you know, the architecture, these, these beautiful structures. I, I mean, I love, actually part of what made me want to be a musician was playing Bach fugues, uh, which I started doing, you know, in junior high school and high school uh, on the piano and the organ. Um, because I mean, you're good with that too, hand stuff. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. A lot of, they, they say a lot of conductors come to conducting via keyboard because we have to read multiple lines. Yes. And, and yeah, so. You're kind of the, vertical. Yeah, there's a more of a vertical dimension to what we do, which is true of an orchestra. That said, I think my approach to, to, to orchestral and choral music is, is more linear than vertical. I, I love um, 
trying to make the melodies come to life in, you know, in a way that I think has real connectedness to the musical language. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, so is Bach your favorite composer or one of your favorites or? Yeah, he probably he probably is. And I have this, I was, I mentioned my first, my second teacher, Rodney Pierce in Buffalo. When I was like 15, I remember asking him in that adolescent way, if you were stuck on a desert island, Mr. Pierce, what piece of music would you want with you so that you could, you know, practice your oboe while you're there on this desert island? And he didn't even miss a beat. He just said, I would need my Bach excerpt book there. I would want access to all the Bach cantatas. And I don't think at that point, when I was 15, I had ever been heard of Bach cantata. So I was a little bit clueless. Right. And then I think of him every single time I That's play any yeah. yeah, I mean, he really, he knew the answer. <laughs> I remember so, doing one of those NPR things on recording on the radio and you were supposed to bring five pieces or something. Yeah. And, um, and so I thought, the B minor mass, of course. Of and after course. I thought that, I thought, now what do I do? You know, that's, <laughs> that's like the that's like the, the mountaintop. That what's left? You know, I, of course, there's p plenty of pieces that are left, but um, yeah. yeah. And and that's been a real pleasure for me. I mean, we've done so many. We've done like 160 Bach cantatas, um, and they don't all have oboe, but you've been in many, many of them. <laughs> and um, uh, boy, if I has that been a joy for me. Do you have a favorite or a couple favorites? Do you know the one of my absolute favorites is 202, the wedding cantata, ah, right. and I mm. haven't played that one yet with you, Herb. So let's let's make that a future plan. When this Actually, that's pandemic on, that, is under control. <laughs> that, that is on my list for not this coming season, but the following. But oh, with, uh, well, I'll hang the, in there. <laughs> with the um, hiatus on concert making that might mean it's not one year out but two but it, it's it's coming yeah. yeah you know the other the other thing i love about bach in baltimore is that you've been so open to suggestions <laughs> from <laughs> yeah. instrumentalists in in the orchestra and that's that's a rare thing conductors you know they they want to lord their superiority over everybody so i really appreciate that you, you know you you ask my opinion frequently i i really value that uh, and i think that that also lends that leads to sort of the character of the entire group of people. And that's one of the things I treasure about Bach in Baltimore, just that community, the musicians in the orchestra, the musicians, they are singing, the, the soloists, oh my gosh, you get these world renowned soloists and maybe they're not renowned yet. They're not known yet, but they will be, you know? I've had, I have more than a few who have ah. <clears throat> gone on to careers at the Met or, or touring the country singing, um, you know, early oratorio type music. Um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased for them and very proud that I, you know, was able to work with them at some point. Me too. Me yeah. too. I mean, I see them on the stage in different settings and I think, wow, what was the number of the cantata that I worked <laughs> with them on? <laughs> right. Mobile players are thinking numbers sometimes more than the actual text, which I think is also an important thing that, that we all should be checking into the text. And you bring that to the table also. You're always explaining to the audiences what to be listening for that goes beyond just a pretty sound. You know, you're talking about the inner depth of Bach. I love that. I love that we do other Baroque music. Uh, you let me play the Roman uh, Oboe de Mort Concerto. Yeah. I mean, a very unknown Baroque composer. Um, and, so, and so beautiful, such a valuable asset to, to the Baroque world. Uh, Zelenka, another one of my favorite Baroque composers, just as complex as Bach and just not as well known, so. And recently we've started doing more Telemann. And, I love Telemann. And I love Telemann. It, you know, I used to always love to say Telemann is the, was the first choice for the Thomas Kierkegaard, and when he wouldn't take the job, they settled for number two, which was Bach. And I always thought, ha, 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 what's wrong with, with you know, those people in, back in, you know, 1723 in Leipzig? Well, part of the answer is Telemann is no slouch. Wow, his music is beautiful. Um, I totally agree. Yeah. And so, um, hey, what you, I, could I talk you into playing a piece for us? Oh, I would love that. Yeah. I'm going to veer off a little bit, I think, and play an unaccompanied piece 
So I won't need any accompaniment, which works really well in a pandemic. And it's going to be actually by Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, who was, yep. was Johann's son uh, and had a really pretty good career on his own. In, I think he was, in his had, lifetime, I think yeah. he was more famous than Papa Bach. I understand um, that. Mozart really liked him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his, music. His, his music is rather beautiful. It, it's definitely moving uh, towards classical. Yeah, a little bit of expressiveness in the harmony, um, but still rooted in Baroque structure. So, yeah. so this yeah. piece is actually the unaccompanied flute sonata. I'm going to play the first movement. And of course, flutes and oboes are always sharing their favorites. So, That's terrific. Well, thanks for chatting with me. And thanks for giving us this treat at the end here by, by um, playing something for us. I, again, what a pleasure. My pleasure. And I can't wait till when we all get back together as an ensemble. Uh, we have such wonderful pieces planned, and I'm, I'm just so eager to, to work with you again in person. Me too. As soon as possible. Everybody yeah. stay safe. Yes. Mask. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sandy. All right. Thanks, Herb. Now, now we get to listen. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.